known diseases in there. Um, you really thoroughly want to go through your hive. Uh, fall management, you're wanting to make sure that they're ready for the winter, that they're building up, that they have the food stores, pollen stores, um, get strong hives, no diseases, no uh, pests in there, uh, so that they have a good chance of surviving the winter. Summer management, um, you're, you're doing this um, just kind of a check and take, you know, take a quick peek at the bees. You don't necessarily have to get in and tear through your hives right now. Um, now's also the time that you can harvest uh, uh, some honey. Uh, typically in the springtime you don't get a chance to harvest the honey because you're trying to get the bees built up and, and get them strong and ready for the summer honey flows that come on. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about harvesting honey as well. Um, so do that. If you want to go ahead and push that. You guys are my guinea pigs. I tried a GoPro. Uh, the sound didn't come out. You know, it was isolated so I didn't get uh, propolis and everything else all over the camera. So no sound. But anytime I'm looking at a uh, hive, and I don't have to go through everything, you can kind of hear me talking. But, um, it, like I said, it's not very loud. I'm always looking for what the brood pattern is. I'm looking to see if I see eggs. I'm looking to see if I see nectar around the edges, any pollen in there. So I'm really looking to see if I need to take care of the bees. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's problems in the hive. Um, so again, th those are the things that I'm always looking for whenever I go in the hive. Once I see that, once I see that there's eggs, once I see, you know, a good brood pattern, and this is where the, the queen, this is all hatched out right here, and she has this laid up, this is the others, this, this in there. Uh, I probably just got stung right there. <laughs> But uh, you got a little honey on the edges, uh, you got some drone root on that there, but no diseases, a little bit of drone root. Uh, but again, she has this all laid up. Um, and so, again, I'm looking to make sure that there's different stages of root. I want to see eggs. I know, even if I don't see the queen, I know that there's a queen in there at least three days ago. And so, again, I want to see eggs, different stages of root. I want to see silk root. It's a balanced hive if you're seeing all that. Uh, I want to see some pollen in there. I want to see some nectar in there. That tells me whether I need to feed them or not, or stop feeding them if I've been feeding them. If they're starting to get full of nectar uh, or sugar water if you're feeding them. Um, and then, of course, I'm looking for any problems, any diseases in the, in the possible root area or any curly wing virus or anything that I've seen that's wrong with the hive. But again, once I go through and look at that, and I see that, and I don't necessarily go through every frame of the hive. In fact, in fact during the summertime, uh, it's, it's in and out as quick as you can. Sometimes I'll only look at two or three frames uh, per hive, and then put it back in, and leave the bees alone and let them do their thing. So it's actually pretty, pretty low key. You really want to see these bees uh, Developing, growing up. If you want to play the, the next one, pull this one down. <coughs> I was really disappointed in the sound, by the way. I was doing, I have bought the microphone and, uh, uh, I, and the program, I've gotten a program so that I can audio. I didn't have time to do that. So I'm going to move that up kind of more in the center. Um, one of the things that you want to do if you don't, and so I figured I'd throw this in here, it's not a very long video, but uh, um, if you have a failing queen, now's the time to replace her. Uh, a lot of times in fall, and so this is a video of me actually replacing the queen. So, uh, they love to propolize it. And so it's and I typically don't use the sugar plug. I let her sit in there for a week, and then I'll pull her out and release her. I'll remove, remove that cork and let her crawl in.
I had the queen that we replaced in open space hive. You have to brush off the bees, otherwise they start calling in the hole as you're trying to release her and she doesn't get out very well. You remove the part. Uh, we actually uh, was going to do that at the open space. We had a queen that was a little more aggressive. So we went in there. Didn't want to kill her. I moved her out to the property where they can have a little bit more aggression out there. She was a phenomenal uh, lane queen. In fact, this uh, uh, swarm from Elizabeth's swarm that she brought over there. Uh, but that's all they do. And I watch the cage, make sure that the queen goes in and crawls in. And she, she ended up being there and brushing these up. Uh, that's all there is to it. Sometimes um, they'll actually fly away when I've waited a week. Uh, in doing that, then um, they've actually flown right into the hive. Uh, I'll, actually, I, I like to tell people, I like to pretend that I'm a bee whisperer, and I watch the queen fly around, and I'm waving to down here, you need to come down here, and watch her fly right in. And what I'm really doing is I'm waving that scent of the hive up to her. In that week's time that she's been trapped, she smells that, and she flies right in. Had that happen three times now. So uh, one time she landed on my shoulder a couple times. You always, with the lace strip hive, want to uh, manage your bee space in here, push your hive uh, frames back together so that they're tight, so they don't compromise it. But that's all you have to do, uh, really, as far as summer management goes. Craig, yes, sir. Um, I've had a couple things. If if you wait a week. Will the bees start making queen cells that you have to go through a lot? No. Uh, typically not. Well, like, you know, if you've heard me talk to them, you'll hear me say that there's absolutely no absolutes in bee keeping. So most of the time they will not build queen cells because they have a queen in there, they're having that queen pheromone. Uh, that's uh, going up throughout the hive. Yeah, but you you pull out the old queen. And then pull you out the old queen before or, you put in the new queen. Right. And so if you have an aggressive queen and you don't have the luxury of taking her out to someplace else to some other hive, um, you kill her, you smash her mandibles against that queen cage, and you can turn the lights on now if you want. Um, you kill her against that, so you're smashing her mandibles, uh, her head against that queen cage. Um, I've had um, actually some people, I've had one lady up in Santa Fe. They started crying when I told her I was going to do that. And it's like, okay, I'll take her and we'll find a good home for her. <laughs> so it's, it's fine. No, I, I have no problem with that. But you, you do, you go ahead and, and again, uh, uh, what that does is it allows the bees in the hive to go up there and smell the old queen scent and know that there's a new queen now that's in charge. And so it really helps as far as them accepting that new queen. Um, the uh, other thing you can do, a lot of times you go in there and uh, you don't see a queen in there, you don't see any signs of a queen, you've lost your queen. Uh, I've had numerous people call me this year and state uh, that they decided to split their hive and let it do its natural thing, which is great, uh, and then didn't have the queen come back. It was not mated. Uh, or it didn't come back, it didn't make it back. There's all kinds of things that could go wrong as far as the mating voyage uh, with the queen. And she get eaten by a bird. Uh, I know we don't get any wind in New Mexico, but <laughs> she could end up in Texas by the time the wind starts blowing her. Uh, so, you know, uh, birds, dragonflies, you know, you name it, uh, things can happen with her. But she doesn't make it back. And so you have a queen, a queen is five. A lot of times when I Go to introduce that queen, I'll take that queen cage and I'll set it on top of the bars. And if it's a top bar hive, I'll move it apart wherever there should brood and set it on top of there and watch to see what the bees do. And a lot of times, if they're queenless, uh, it's so neat to see. You know they're queenless when the bees just come up. You see the excitement just kind of spread through the hive and they're all starting to come up on top of them. Like, migrate to the queen and take care of her uh, and feed her. Uh, that's one of the situations I see. And I know that, you know, that it's probably queenless uh, and put it in. I've had cages uh, where queens have died in there. 
And 100% of the time, it's because there's a queen already in the hive. There's a virgin queen or a queen that went out that hasn't been laying yet. She's maybe gone out and made her main, main, main to flight and then come back and has a certain way, and they'll find the queen dead in the cage uh, where she hasn't been released. There's a queen in that hive, I almost guarantee it, or a queen cell that they are making a queen. They've already decided before they introduce that queen. Um, and so uh, they've already decided to do that, and they stop taking care of her. It's not that the queen comes up and kills her, uh, because that queen will move back and she won't allow herself to be stung. But the bees at some point will stop taking care of her. They say, hey, we've got a queen in here. We don't need this queen. We're going to not take care of her. And so she ends up dying. So hopefully that answers your question. It does. Do you ever use a uh, cage to cage the new queen and then push it into the comb as opposed to the little box? I have not. However, I have recommended that where I had a lady that was down in Las Cruces said her bees have killed the queen a couple of times as a cager. Uh, and she said these are probably Africanized bees. I said cage her so she starts laying and move that where she's around when she starts laying and stuff and she said it worked. Uh, it was a good method to do and stuff. So absolutely. Yes, Chris. Great. Um, I remember when certification from many years ago. Uh, one of the things that you recommended then was to, uh, if you were requeening, to take the old queen and kill her and wipe her mandible in the landing area. Because well, the landing area or the queen cage, right. yes. Because a lot, the majority of bees it's stick forage are sticking in and out. Not so much the nurse bees, but they all eventually are. Yeah, they'll, they'll pass it on. It's it's uh, better if you do it on against the thing and then uh, against the queen cage, and then you can leave her. Uh, so I learned as well as so I continue to go. So, yeah. But uh, uh, it's better against the queen cage. You know, can you leave the queen uh, dead on the mantle? So this is honey. One of the things I was asked also. Pass, it, pass this around. So both of these are a little bit different. Uh, Yes, it, it's, just, it's a sweet stickiness, right? Uh, so it's a good sticky. Uh, nice thing about honey is it washes off really easily. Or if yeah, you lick it off. So uh, these are a couple frames that I pulled from Truth or Consequences. Um, I've had, so any other questions as far as the queens go or any other questions as far as summer management? Okay. Um, I was noticing last year that um, I had treated, say, I guess in August for mites, and then in September, October, uh -huh. ended up still having a pretty high mite count. Okay. So I read in Heron's book that he was suggesting taking the honey off early, end of June, 1st of July, and treating in July, since there's an exponential growth of mites toward approaching the fall. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And also, I found when I went to do this yesterday that a lot of my honey wasn't wet yet. Yes. So, uh, a couple things. Uh, as far as honey production, my, my treatment, you want to do mite counts now is when you really want to treat for mites. You want to check for mites, you want to find out where you're at um, as well, and that's just getting some bees in, in the brood center. Um, yeah, if both sides have a pass on both sides because it's different, different on both of them. Um, as far as the frames, but uh, as far as it depends on the treatment that you're doing. Some treatments, like if you're doing powdered sugar, or if you're, you know, uh, it's called uh, uh, just old senile. Uh, the sugar shake. We do powdered sugar all the time. That's something I'm talking. Yeah. So powdered sugar. Um, if you're doing, um, if you're caging the queen, stopping the brood cycle. Um, so there's different treatments that you can do as far as mites. If you're doing formic acid or silic acid or uh, some, something that's a little more forceful with the mites, uh, you definitely don't want to pull your honey off right there. You don't want to have honey in there. If you want to pull your honey off, you don't want to uh, have honey that's being made at that time when you're doing those kind of treatments. So check for mites first of all to see where they're at. And then, um, if it's severe enough, then you're going to have to do it. 
more than likely if it's severe enough, you're not going to have much of a honey crop in there. Um, you definitely don't want to have um, um, you definitely don't want to have green honey uh, to harvest and stuff. You want to be able to do that. So the two friends that are going around, um, I don't harvest it unless it's more than 50%. This is pretty much 100%, the one that's going back right now. Uh, this is about 50%, uh, or a little bit less than 50%. It's probably about 30% on both sides. Um, capped, capped honey. Uh, so that's, that's um, so this one I probably wouldn't harvest. I would not harvest. I would want it a little bit fuller as far as capped goes. Um, it's kind of funny because uh, Ken, Ken Hayes and I went down and he He's the one that pulled that. So oh, here's here's one for honey harvest. He says he doesn't have problems with that. In New Mexico, it's dry enough; it will continue to cure. I personally don't like to take that chance. I would recommend 50 percent, 75 percent, you know, at least 50 percent on both sides, uh, and you shake it to make sure there's no green honey that's coming out. There's no drops coming out. And I shook a couple of them, and had some drops come out. So I knew that there was uh, a green fresh honey that was in there. That green fresh honey will have a chance of fermenting uh, because it's not cured all the way. So again, I don't, I don't want to take that chance. But it sounds like you're saying that earlier treatment rather than waiting to the fall for my treatment is, is well timed. I, I would treat for mites. When I check it, if I have a, a high count for mites, Treat. Treat. Yeah. But you're not going to treat without checking. I'm not going to treat without checking. Okay. And, and the reason why is because how do you know it's working right. if you don't have a baseline to start with, uh, to begin with. So uh, so that is a frame of honey that I'll definitely extract. How much honey do you need them for winter? Good, good question. Uh, so right now, and, and we'll talk about this as far as the, the honey harvest, I had um, someone that wanted me to harvest their honey for them and extract it for them since I had an extractor that they didn't. Um, and he did it in the fall and I thought that the same thing. I had the hardest time to extract it because it was mostly crystallized. You want to extract the honey when it is ready to extract, be it June, July, August, we'll typically get, a, you know, so we just come out of a honey flow. Um, typically right now, it's a little bit of a dry period. I have to share with you. Um, the rains we had a couple weeks ago, the choya all around my place was blooming. And I told my wife, I said, oh, you know, it looks like the, the choya is blooming. I bet the bees are going on there. I don't think we're going to have to feed. And uh, then we started looking in at the hives. I saw this one bee that was walking around with a piece of straw or grass that was three times bigger than her, wandering around the hive with it. And I said, what in the world is that? And so I finally got a hold of it and pulled it. It was a choya spine, a cactus spine. On there, I found three other bees with the choya cactus spine in them that I was able to pull out. So the choya doesn't only bother us, it also bothers the bees. So, but uh, I told my wife, I think I need to just kind of go through there and spot check the bees and see if I need to help them and pull out some cactus. I didn't see any more uh, last time I went through the hives, I didn't, I didn't see any. But, uh, uh, so you want to harvest when you have the honey. Um, you don't want to sit there and wait. It's got a little weight to it, doesn't it? Greg, will, will bees take the crystallized honey over the winter? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so leave it. Leave it for the bees. So the frames, the amount of frames that I leave, and so right now we're going to have another honey flow. So I will still leave them though, um, and I'm always generous to the bees. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually gotten any honey from my bees for the last five or six years uh, because 
even though there was some, last year, in fact, I pulled some off here in town, and then they stopped, the honey flow stopped, and the bees started taking everything they had, and I ended up giving it back to them. I had it for about a week, and I ended up taking it back to the hives and, and redistributing it throughout the hive so they had the honey to go into the winter. Uh, you can feed them now, supplement them as far as some sugar water if you need to. Um, but I would rather leave them with honey in there. And so for a Langstroth hive, and I brought, this, this is not how you set up a Langstroth hive, sorry. This, this would typically be the brood box, and then it, these would be the supers, and these would be on top. You can have the two mediums as your brood box as well, and then mediums up on top as well so that you have the same frames to adjust to out there. But, so I treat this as a deep, the two mediums as a deep or this. So I like to leave two frames on each side of honey for them for the winter and then one in the middle somewhere. So five frames in each box full of honey. And this also, obviously you would double that because I treat it as, as one thing. And I'll put it, make sure it's on the outside. Um, the bees will move it where they need to, uh, where they want to and stuff. Uh, one of the things I learned also with open space, uh, we have uh, some frames that were, uh, and I don't have it here, um, that, that were um, foundationless. So the bees built their comb on there, which was fine. They built what I call drone comb, it's honeycomb, but it's larger comb, and so if a queen gets in there and lays in it, it's drone comb. Not a problem. I just make sure, unless I want them to build drones, I make sure it's on the outside sides, and they'll fill it full of honey instead of her going and lay it. Typically, they leave those two frames on the outside with honey. That's typically how the bees will do that. So I'll put that frame on the outside. You can also put it up in the center uh, of the, the hive, and uh, you know they'll go up and eat it. I ended up doing that for the winter. Wasn't thinking. The bees go up, eat the honey out, and the first thing the queen does once that's free is lays it full. I have a hive full of drones <laughs> because she laid that frame full. It's like oh, I should have thought about that. And nature was thinking enough in the winter time through the spring that she was going to get up there and start laying in that make sure that that was on the side and not in the center. So you can leave some honey in the center as well. Again, the bees will move up to it. Um, so, that, um, anyways, I, I, so I answered your question on that. I finally got around to it. So, yes sir? In extracting, in extracting, uh, I have a manual extractor that holds two foundations. Right. And uh, I cap it, and it uh, looks like it's ready to to uh, harvest. Um, but I crank and crank and crank this thing, and I still got quite a bit of honey inside it. It's not just Okay. But I don't know how. I've never been around anybody else that did that that I've extracted. So I don't know how long do you and you have a manual uh, manual extractor which is a little bit more challenging you have to get it moving hard enough uh, to extract it to pull it out I don't worry if I don't get every single drop out because I'll put those frames back in and the bees will clean it out and move it to where they want to so I'm not worried about getting every single drop out um, it was Kind of funny when I went to the house. With, I brought the honey home from TRC on uh, Monday about seven o'clock at night. I hadn't eaten. I was, you know, if anyone's worked with Ken, you don't you work through lunch. My blood sugar level was like down here. I mean, I'm ready to pass out. And I get home finally and said, I need to go get something to eat. My wife says, Are you gonna move the honey out so the bees don't start taking it? And it's like, no, no, it should be fine. It's getting close enough to dark. Um, so I went out there and kind of looked. I had to go get grab a queen and uh, out of my queen bank. And so I did that. 
I've kind of peeked on the bees a couple times. There's a couple hundred bees starting to fly around. Not a problem. Went, sit, sat down, ate dinner. Went back out there. There was probably three or four thousand bees out there at that time, just buzzing around the truck. Uh, I'm going great. You know, there goes. You know, I figured I was going to get about four, five gallon buckets of honey from this. I said I'm down to at least three, five gallon buckets of honey now, probably. So. Um, the interesting thing, though, also, uh, that happened, my wife had a brilliant idea. She goes, let's hop in the truck and let's drive around in the bees until it gets dark. <laughs> <laughs> and so the bees that are there will fly off and hopefully find their way home and they won't keep taking your honey. The interesting thing that happened was the honey they took was the green honey that Ken put in. They didn't touch the cat honey. They didn't touch, they, they took what was the most efficient and easiest for them to take, which was the wetter honey. So they pulled out that wetter honey. Now, that frame that I will probably extract, that I said I wouldn't extract, you'll notice it's got holes where it had the wetter honey in, where the bees have pulled that all out. So, it's like problem solved. Maybe I should have left it a little bit longer, but yeah, it's like they were, they were going to town this minute. I have a pest problem that I just was hoping maybe you've seen. Just I have this ant colony that loves to live on my top, my inner top, uh, my inner lid. Okay. And I keep getting rid of it and stomping on it and killing all of the eggs. It lays its eggs. And then and so so I go in there back again. The little, little tiny. They're the little ants, they're like a little. And, the, and I know. They're like, honey, they're, honey collar, just. <laughs> probably. Yeah, really, really, nice really, really, really small. Probably about pin, pin yeah, size. Yeah, really small. Yeah. So, uh, aside from planting yarrow and waiting for it to grow, yeah. or tansy and waiting for it to grow, what else? <laughs> so, um, put them up on blocks. They're on blocks. Um, I've used Avon Skin So Soft. <laughs> Let's spray them on the blocks. It will make it so the ants won't go up in there and find it. Also, black widows uh, won't get into your blocks and stuff. And the bees don't actually um, land on the blocks and crawl up the blocks, and so it doesn't bother the bees at all. So uh, the other thing that you can do, I've heard you can put cinnamon around. Um, like powder cinnamon, like powder cinnamon around, around it. Around no, around it. Um, and that will stop the ants from coming in until it rains or the wind blows it away. Um, but like I said, I found the skin so soft it actually worked pretty well. Um, I, I've had places where I've seen those ants. I've never had them build a hive inside. They just keep coming back in. They're like yeah. under the outer cover and on top um, of the inner cover. It's cover. interesting watching them because you watch, the, you watch the bees, you watch the reactions. And it's not. It's like they don't even care. They don't care. They're coexisting. They're coexisting, they exactly. They don't care. And I'm thinking, it's like, man, how much? Because it's like a six-lane freeway <laughs> going back and forth. And it's like, oh my gosh, how much honey are these you know, ants pulling out? And I'm not seeing that much of a difference. So I don't know what they're doing, for sure. But the ants and the bees don't. If you get other ants, bigger ants and stuff, in there, you'll see the bees try to chase them. And, and you know, just like with a wasp or another bee that doesn't belong to these, they, I don't know if they just don't see them, they don't care, but solutions. Uh, I've also heard you can put them up on a stand and put, uh, and I've seen it work, uh, I've seen it work where they put motor oil. I wouldn't recommend that, but vegetable oil works just as well. You put it, legs in the can, of, you know, an old soup can, put vegetable oil on there, and that way the bees, or the ants can, and then again, the bees don't. In there. So if you have legs on those stands, you can do that, and that will keep the ants from going in. And that's a more permanent solution. So. I tried that one time in May. Um, With the cans? With the cans. Uh -huh. And uh, the can got full of bees. Okay. Uh, what? Well, back in. I mean, I ended up killing all, all these bees. Well, I'd probably have a huge number of bees. What, what did you use? Did you use the oil? Dynamation, sir. And then I read somewhere on one of the blocks that, for some reason, walnut leaf 
you can find a walnut tree and put leaves up on your top. Um, because it seems like that's where those little, bee, little ants make their nests is up between the inner and the outer cover. Um, put the, for some reason, the walnut leaves. Could, could do it. I don't know so what, what, what did you use as far as in your cans? I, I got rid of the cans and just But what, what did you use? Oh, um, motor oil. oil. Motor oil. And that's why I would recommend because the motor oil looks like water. And so the bees will, and other things will get into the motor oil. That's why I recommended vegetable oil. So, yes. Uh, ours are on legs and we're starting to get ants recently. We wrapped them in duct tape. Is that okay with the sticky side out? It seems to. No longer the ants are crawling across it. You'll catch a lot of cockroaches too, because I'm not. <laughs> So they, they, so I'm learning. I learn all the time. Uh, it's because I come out and work with you, you and you guys have all these questions. And stuff. Your answers. Got some of those cheap Tupperware. They're like two dollars each, but they're like for a big salad. And then I have top bar hives with two by four stands, and so I cut it so there was only a quarter inch around the lid. But it's enough space that the ants can't make a bridge across, but the bees won't get into the water and it keeps it from evaporating so much. Nice. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So all, all kinds of good suggestions and stuff. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for helping me teach the class. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go back to silver makers? Absolutely. When, when you're checking your two bars, uh -huh. you're doing your quick check, are you doing that in the brew box? So you're taking them off with your slippers? Yes. Going down to the brew box, I'm going down in the brew two, box. Two there, but, and then putting it all back together. See, right now in the summertime, I'm actually not checking that unless I've got, because I'm not really concerned about that until fall. So that's what I'm going to leave them in the fall time. So in the, in the uh, I do want to go down and check the brew. And so I'm kind of looking in there and still seeing if there's honey. It's typically that first frame that I'll pull out uh, on the sides. And first step and then pull out, you know, move it over and then pull out from the brood so I can see the eggs and stuff. If, uh, so that's, but that brings up another good question. In the, um, because I'm not going through it all, um, if I'm going through my honey supers where I'm actually wanting to harvest the honey that, that I think is for me, and if I see that there's brood up in there, I don't use a queen excluder, and that's, again, my personal choice. The reason why I don't is because I figure if the queen's going to come up there late, it's a safety valve to keep them from swarming. She needs that room um, to go up there. If there's brood up there, I just move it to the outsides, and that brood hatches, they'll fill it full of honey. So, but that also gives me an indication that I need to look down below and see how much honey is down there and see if I can move that brood and add honey down inside those brood chambers and stuff. Uh, because if they fill something all the way full of honey down on the bottom, uh, that's not going to do them any good. Uh, as far as, uh, well, it's, it's still their honey, but it's not giving them the room that she needs where I want her down the lane and stuff. So I'll go through it a little bit more thoroughly. So, good question. Any other questions? You said you shake your for the to, to see if there's green honey. What? How do you do that on a top bar without breaking the comb off? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and then the coolest part of the day. Coolest part of the day. Yeah. Um, so you have to support it. So you know that's um, definitely an advantage as far as lane strip hive. You can you know it's unless you're foundationless. Then you have the same issue and stuff. And so you have to support it um, looking for eggs. Uh, there's a lot of times, you know, you have to tilt it for the right angle. And what I tell people when I'm helping them with the top bar is, yeah, you're holding that um, edge and then watching it because if it's warm enough, like Anita said, uh, or Ned said, sorry, um, that, you know, if it starts slumping a little bit, you want to make sure it's gets back to perpendicular so you're not breaking that off. You just have to watch it. But yeah, you just, it's kind of like for checking for mites. You know, you're, you're shaking the bees off into the cup. Again, you have to do it very carefully, but you can keep it more perpendicular and stuff. So, uh, as far as shaking for mites. 
But you have to do that to get the bees off. Brushing the bees off just really upsets them, and you don't get a lot of bees in where you're trying to gather that half a cup of bees to monitor your 300 bees and stuff. So you have to shake it off, but give it the support group so it's not in either thing. Um, and you're going to want to have it kind of in an angle. So all the, all the comb that the bees build will have a slight angle up like this because they let gravity help them hold that honey in place and that root in place. So you have to kind of tip it upside down and shake it and see if you have it. If it's got fresh, uh, I've had it come out where it looks like it's raining. It's so green at times. It's not an absolute. And I have honey that is old honey that they've capped. And then the new honey that's in there is just rain, raining like raindrops out. And it's like, okay, I, I don't want to pull this. I want to let it sit. So, but good question. So you should be able to flip it upside down and, and, and shake it and see that it comes out. So. Um, you can also order a honey refractometer. I just tried it for the first time today, totally like geeked out. And you can see the actual water percentage of your honey. So you just smear a little bit of it on the plate and hold it up to the light. You have to calibrate it first and there's more to it, but it'll show you the actual percentage. So, which I think it needs to be between 16 and 18%. So. It was really fun to see like so, how close the bees get. If you don't like how much did that cost? It was like twenty-two bucks. Not, not bad. Yeah, but so, look up the one for honey because it's the measurements are you know closer to where we need them. So. And so you're just looking at it as far as the color? No, um, I have a picture. Hold on, it's an actual scale, <laughs> and I liked this because you're not guessing, um, so I get paranoid. <laughs> about food safety, if I'm going to be really honest. So it looks like this, like a little scale. Is it a gizmo? Yes, a gizmo. Where did you get it? Amazon. Can you see it? A uh, refractometer. So oh, man lake, yeah. But yeah, it was really fun. Check, check the light microphone. Yeah, you have to hold it up to the light because it's measuring how much light's coming it, through. It, it measures how much that light goes through and it refracts it. From. Yeah, it refracts the light depending on the cool. sugar or the moisture water content and stuff. Uh, they can get a lot more expensive too. So. This one worked great though. Worth so. probably worth Oh yeah. Yeah. So, any other? Questions. Yeah. So any honey in the hive right now is our honey. I wouldn't say any honey in the hive right now is our honey. I still need the bees some honey. Um, but if it's up in my supers, so the, so the boxes that I have down in tier C, um, they're four or five boxes high. Because of they're, the queens are doing so well that I've got brood in three boxes. In fact, I had some brood in the fourth box on some of the hives. And so I added more hives in there. On it, actually, a pretty good honey flow down there. It's the mesquite tamarisk uh, honey that was down there. So they were doing well, building up well. Um, and so that's the boxes I go through. The honey that's down in here, I don't touch. Now, come fall, when I'm looking at it, there are times where I have a full box of super that's on there, and I'm looking down below. So you have, because of what you've seen in the springtime, or when you go in there and just kind of look at the brood, you want to see if, if you're seeing just solid brood and no honey whatsoever around that brood, you might not want to take it all. And that was kind of with Ken, when I was talking to Ken, when he was saying, oh, you can take this, why aren't you taking this? And it's like, I just simply leave it for the bees if they need it. It's green right now. If it's still there in a couple weeks and it's been capped over, then I can take it. So usually, uh, once they cap it over, that's their food storage. They're planning on using that at a later time. Uh, so that's, again, fair game. But when I'm looking at the brood, I'm wanting to make sure that there's some honey around it. 
You have some queens that just do phenomenal and just lay everything when there's very little honey around them. You want to make sure that they have some honey. So again, these two boxes, two frames on the side should have some honey in them. Usually they do. So, uh, but if it's up in the super, I'll pull it. So you mentioned, oh, sorry. You mentioned several reasons why to re-clean pests or disease um, or bad brood pattern. What about for boxes or packages or splits where they haven't really done much at all? Like I have one hive that has five bars of comb and three of brood and that's it. I, I went to help someone uh, right now. It's interesting um, that he has nice enough hives. Um, he got a, a new, it was a three frame new full of bees. And I went and looked at it, and he got it back in May, and it was still three frames full of bees. And it's like, oh my goodness. I, I've had it where, when I've installed packages, I've had um, you know, 20 packages, all from the same area, that had two of them that were superstars. Uh, within a couple weeks, they were t uh, 10 frames across. Um, I have, and typically when you're doing the four pounds of bees, it's a good four or five frames of bees when you're doing it. Um, I've had it where there were two, two of the 20 packages. In fact, I had one when I went down a week later to make sure the queen was released. They hadn't even released the queen. And they built a little comb around her, and that was it. And it's like, what are you slackers doing? You didn't even release the queen. Come on, girls. Grab a frame of brood if you have it from the other hive. Throw it in there. A lot of times that kick starts them. And that's what I recommend to this guy. If you find someone that had some brood that was in the area and add to that, it will kickstart. And that's what I did. A couple weeks later, I couldn't tell the difference between them, the slackers, and I grabbed it from the superstars and from the rest of these that were doing really well. They just weren't superstars and they weren't slackers. And so. But it has to be worker brood. Worker brood. Yes. 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 Do you take the nurse bees too or not? Yes, yes. absolutely. Okay. A absolutely. And that's a good question. I get that asked all the time. It, it, so think about it. So if a bee's going into a hive to rob something, they're robbing honey. So if you put honey from one hive to another, fights on. Because those are bees that are going to probably that are possibly bringing in honey. A lot of times, you know, they're passing and transferring the honey and stuff. That fights on still because they're protecting the honey. Bees don't go in to rob brood. They're nurse bees, they're not fighting, they don't care. Um, I have a lady that I was helping top bar hive, and this is a good point for top bar hives. She had two different size hives, um, which was kind of funny. She says she had a hive that was ready to swarm, she thought, a hive that was really struggling. We went and looked, and I said, absolutely, let's move some brood from this hive to the other hive. And she starts getting ready to brush the bees off. I said, no, no, leave the bees on there. She looked at me like I was crazy. She said, everything I've read and seen on the internet, you need to brush the bees off. I said, no, no, trust me. So we took it over there, realized it was a different size, had the hand saw it, hit down to make it fit, break a little brood off uh, to make it fit. And I said, that's great going this way, but what happens next year when it goes the other way? You know, build your hives the same size. Um, and I said, listen to them. Listen to what it does. You know, put it in between the brood, where the other brood is at, and listen to what it does. I said, what does it sound like? And she goes, it sounds like they're happy. And I said, yeah, they're saying, hallelujah, the calories come, we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> We've got reinforcements. Does that so, mean when you combine uh, weaker hides with the stronger, you don't need to put the paper? So... <laughs> No, because that has foragers. That has foragers and everything else in it. So, yes. Oh. So, if you're just taking a frame of brood with the nurse bees on there, then you don't have a problem. But that's a good question. The newspaper trick is good. So, if you're putting in a uh, nucleus, because you've lost the queen, you know, you're, if you've heard me talk, you've heard me talk about two and a half hives. And one is a nucleus that has a hot standby queen in there. You still want to do the newspaper trick because you have honey, they've got worker bees, and everything that's in that mix and stuff. So. You might want to warn about not taking more than two frames of brood. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So, and that's that's a good point. You don't want to take more than two frames of root. I've had people ask me, uh, well, when can I take a frame of root from my hive? And I say, there's got to be at least five frames of root. Um, the sixth frame is the one that, well, so I should say at least six frames of root. You want to leave five in the hive at least. The sixth frame of root. If you start pulling more than two frames of root, the bees think there's something wrong with the hive, and sometimes they'll kill the queen with it and have problems. Now, the exception to that rule, and I've had a ton of people that say the bees that they got uh, this year are just doing phenomenal, and they've decided to split them, and so they've ordered a queen for me. You can split them. You're doing an artificial swarm when you're doing that. You're moving the old queen into the new hive area, taking a lot of brood, taking some honey and stuff. Some of the bees will go back. They're, it's the same hive, so you're, you're splitting it. They understand that they've just kind of swarmed. So, so you can do that as far as the split goes. So but good, good point. Any other comments, questions? I know there's so much, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate it. Appreciate your time. And um, by all means. Um, what oh, it's like my name is Craig Norman. <laughs> <laughs> Collect IDs. And then please don't forget about, I think it's going to be great. I'm going to do another plug for the New Mexico, I got, since I'm president, I guess I should, but I'm going to do another plug for the New Mexico Beekeepers Association meeting in August. Should be a great meeting. Uh, lots of uh, fun thing about Dr. Vila. If you don't know who Dr. Vila is, uh, research him a little bit. He is one of the geneticists down in Louisiana that is working with Russian bees and everything else and really knows his stuff as far as mites uh, and trying to get a resistant bee for the mites and stuff. So it should be pretty interesting. Um, anyone that, uh, online? Make your computer easier to use. <laughs> Windows will read and send this list automatically. Press the space bar to select the highlighted option. About maybe people next next at the next meeting that people can break up into groups in like in your general area so you get to know some of the other beekeepers in your area. So if you want some help getting in your hive to that you can you can travel back and forth so so that you don't have to do it alone. So next month we we will break up into groups towards the end of the meeting and you can get to know some of your, your neighbor beekeepers. Okay? Cool. So. cool.